it's, um, I'm pleased that one of the worries I had today was that I'd be going to a room full of people who knew far more about Luria than I did. Um, so I'm assuming that's not the case. Mm -hmm. Good. Um, I've got to start off by thanking the organisers and I'm forward to beating Eva also for letting me read a chapter on personality by Yin Yenko in a book that's coming out. It's meant that I've sort of changed what I'm going to say and it's been a great, great thing to read. Um, the other thing is I'm going to present this talk in such a way that what I'm really presenting are ideas that I'm thinking about, questions that I'm trying to ask myself, etc. So um, I'll go through it, hopefully uh, 15 minutes maximum for, for me talking. Well, I see you consent to that. Yeah. Um, 15 minutes maximum for me talking, and then a discussion, and hopefully not just me, fielding tricky questions. So a little bit about myself, because I think it's important to my understanding of uh, romantic science. Uh, for many years, I was a teacher of literacy to adults. And then I got into university. Uh, uh, I got a post in a university uh, to teach teachers of literacy to adults. So that led me, uh, I started to do a PhD. And I was working with a group of friends doing the PhD. We were in, working in a tradition which is a sort of unusual one in a sense. It's life story work. Basically, you collect or work with people build up their life stories, analyze them, and present the analysis. Yeah. This led me to think back to my first encounter with Luria in the sort of early 80s, it would have been. And I was a Marxist, and I, like many Marxists at that time, we knew exactly what it was. We knew exactly what was true. We knew exactly what was false and all of that. And I knew that I liked Luria. And I was in Heffer's bookshop in Cambridge and I found his biography, autobiography. And in it, there was a ch chapter called Romantic Science. You can't imagine my disappointment. Um, you know, this, what, what, as a Marxist, as I thought, what science and romantic science this can't possibly make any sense. But I had to revisit it when I was doing the life story work, yeah? Because collecting these life stories, again, as a Marxist, I felt that collecting the life stories, listening to people talking about their lives, you began to see in a real living form things which you would find in Marx. Uh, I was working mostly collecting stories of literacy teachers on the Isle of Thanet, a very deprived area in Kent. And suddenly, if you started to think about the lives that they're talking about, categories like alienation took on a very different meaning because you could actually see the alienation as it really exists in people's lives, yeah, as they live it. Uh, also, another Marxist who came straight back to me when I was doing the life story work was Harry Breverman, who writes about um, the degradation of uh, labor under monopoly capital and the degradation of work in the 20th century. So I had to go back and I started to rethink actually, there is something in this notion of romantic science which I rejected. So, could we go to the next slide? Anyway. Um, so, about Luria there, first of all, he, he describes himself as a follower and a developer of Vygotsky, but he says that his life's work, his, his own life's work, was devoted to the, the development of ideas from Vygotsky. Um, Mid-30s, uh, the story goes that he was warned by Vygotsky, that the type of work that they were doing was going to land them in very, very serious trouble. So to cut a very long story short, Luria went off into neuroscience, yeah, um, because that 
was probably an area that was not going to be, it was very materialistic, or it would appear to be very materialistic. So it wasn't that. But into the 70s, and especially the late 70s, I don't know the dates that the, his two romantic science books were published in Russia, but it was, they're up there, the sort of Mind of a Man 1967 in English, and the Man with a Shattered World, 1972 in English. In his biography, Yuri refers to these as his examples of romantic science. They were two case studies which he worked on as a neurologist over, uh, I think, 30 years, on perhaps, yeah, 30 years. Um, the Mind of a Menomist was a study of the life of a man who was a menomist, which is a memory man in common parlance, yeah? And the man with the shattered world is a contrasting thing, because whereas the menomist had terrible problems in his life as a result of, uh, as Luria said, a what appeared to be an infinite memory. He could not forget anything. The, re the reverse was the man with the shattered world, the story of a young Red Army officer who receives a head injury during the Second World War and loses a lot of his memory and a lot of his cognitive faculties and has to fight to get them back. The Man with a Shattered World is much my favourite book of the two uh, because it is an absolute testament to human endeavour. Luria doesn't say so, but to his, obviously, and also to the, this poor man recovering from a head injury. So, what does he mean by romantic science, if we can, next slide? Okay, Luria revisits a problem which I think was first posed by Vygotsky and indeed by Luria in the 20s. And this is the opposition of what they call in psychology, nomothetic and ideographic approaches to psychology. Nomothetic being the idea of the study of science, trying to study laws, yeah? Building up laws. What I would have said, um, we heard about this morning from Ilyenkov's work by Isabel, I think it was, where she talked about the dismemberment, or she was quoting uh, Ilyenkov, talking about the dismemberment of reality. And against that, you have the ideographic, the it, it is essentially a form, a an attempt to describe. Yeah. Uh, Ro Luria poses the resolution of the two tendencies, the opposition of these two tendencies. Luria poses that the answer to this rests in romantic science. Okay, um, he poses that in contrast to classical science, which is that, yeah, I think we can go on to the next one. Yeah, so he, what, he's talking about romantic science. What does he mean by that? Well, it's a sort of what he calls a romantic approach goes back to the work of, I would say, classically to Goethe and Goethe's approach to science which I think can be categorized as romantic. This uh, is quite different to what we might think of as romanticism. It's an idea of a science which tends, tries to be holistic and tries to incorporate what we um, might call the emotional or even the affective dimension of knowledge, of understanding of the world. Um, and again, it's, so it's this attempt to do it. He rejects classical science, Luria later rejects classical science, because he says that it's again, involved in the creation of ever more abstract laws, the carving up of reality into bits so that you can't put them back together. The process which Gotsky always said was necessary if you were to ascend from the abstract to the concrete. If you were to ascend to the concrete, you needed to be able to put the abstractions back together. Okay, and then another thing to think about in this is actually thinking back on capital and reading that. It is absolutely jam-packed full of affected stuff. Marx has all of those literary illusions in there. 
not just because he wants, not just because he wants to show off how much literature he knows. It's not just that that's there, but it's also there because he uses this to the reader. If you're a perceptive reader of Capital, I would say that it's very, very hard not to find, not to be taken in with the affective dimension which Marx definitely wants to work on. Yeah, his description of, um, if you know German literature, a Goethe story of the elf in Pony. Um, kidnapping children, uh, taking them away to die, and Marx comparing that to kids and people having to enter the Victorian factory system. It's very clear that, all right, it's not very clear, but I'm going to stick my head out and say Marx too was a romantic scientist, was very, very interested in being romantic, the romantic or the affective dimension. Okay. And it's also this thing of, I think, romantic science with what it incorporates, what Luria describes in the two examples he gives of romantic science. I think that that is also, and it can be seen as an attempt to present the concrete as Marx describes it. That This description here is um, from the Grundrisse. It's the classical description, I think, of the abstract and the concrete, or one of the classical descriptions of it. And it's this attempt to bring together the diverse elements of the concrete, yeah, to create a concrete picture. And I think that that is where, uh, certainly for Luria in his romantic science, where he's offering these life stories, that's what he's trying to do, bringing together different aspects of these two exceptional people in terms of the sort of uh, memory or loss of memory. Okay, and then, well, so this is where I'm still trying to figure out just how important this essay of Ilyenko von personality is. Definitely important. But he starts from, I think it's fair to say, starts from the premise of Marx's sixth thesis on Furback, which is fair enough. We've got it there. Um, I'm pleased to say that having looked through it on Marxist internet, internet, I was, uh, came across the tenth one as well, which is a real surprise to me. I don't know why. I don't know. We Maybe we've all had this. You read Marx, and then you read it again years later, and you're ashamed of how naive you were the first time you read it and the fact that you understood it all so clearly, and then you come back and you think, well, what a dolt I was, you know, <laughs> what, what, how brainless. And because we've got the 10th one there as well. I love this one. The standpoint of the old materialism is civil society. The standpoint of the new is human society, or, wait for it, social humanity. Very powerful stuff. And I'll finish up there with, I mean, as you can see, I'm trying to get, trying to work through things, trying to think about them. I'd be very happy to get comments and discussion about this. But the, the, the quote there from the essay on personality, the essence of each individual resides in the fully concrete system of mutually interacting individuals. I link that to this idea of social humanity as well. I think there's a lot there. And definitely Ilyenkov is dealing with this question of individuality and personality. But it's this question of interacting individuals. Yeah. As a, I think that's almost we could say as a balance or as a dialectical movement. If we take the sixth and the tenth thesis on floor back, we can see there's a dialectical interchange between them. All right, that'll do. Thank you. Great. Yeah. Um, Okay, let's start with a dialogue with Andy Brandon and then Rockney, and then we'll come back to the room and then go back to you, George, after that. But it's okay. So, Andy. Yeah, uh, thanks for that talk. It was uh, nice to hear. Uh, you're completely right. Um, in fact, uh, I was involved in a discussion where people, uh, I had to put it that people didn't know what was meant by a unit of analysis. So I went back to find the origin 
of the idea. And of course, it, it was Goethe, or actually Herder, who was a good friend of Goethe's, Johann Gottlob, uh, Gottfried Herder. Um, but it was um, um, Goethe that formulated it in the form of the Ur phenomenon, right? And Hegel, of course, was a slavish admirer of Goethe. And uh, according to Hegel, in the letters he wrote to Goethe, um, uh, his philosophy had its origins in Goethe. And you're quite right, of course, that the uh, the business of abstract and concrete um, has its origins in romantic science, the, the science of the romantic movement, in other words. Um, and it, its aim was very much holism, and it was an, uh, an antithetical to what they thought of as Newtonian science, that is probably unfair. But it's not really that it's about effect and emotion. It, that Goethe described his method as delicate in empiricism, right? Just um, being with the object so that you, you, the aim was not to introduce these kind of abstractions, yeah, but to grasp the thing itself sensuously and to find the key to the whole in the single individual. There's a saying of his, the, something like the universal is particular, the particular is the universal. Uh, that, that's Goethe saying that. Um, so this whole current of thinking of which Ulyenkov is a part has its origins in Goethe and Goethe's discussions with Herder. Herder's problem was to understand the spirit of a people. Why did one nation or another uh, have its particular fate, its place in the world? And that meant, um, I mean, Marx says the term, that is it that industry which casts its hue upon everything? Yeah, I forget, I haven't got the thing right, somewhere in the Grundrisse. And that's what um, Herder was trying to do. So anyway, agree with what you say. It was a great talk. Thank you. Thank you. Um, that's good to hear. The only thing which disturbed me there was you began by saying I was absolutely right. I've never been absolutely right on anything. I gave that up when I was a teenager. Oh, and I qualified that with about it not really being about effect, yeah. but simply the immediate perception of the object, like in Luria's wonderful case studies. I, I think that, I mean, if I, if I think about Goethe's uh, study of colour, I was very impressed with that when he's really talking about how why he can't stand Newton. Um, mm. And um, I think he overdoes that, by the way. But yeah. uh, mm. the part of it is that he, he objects to Newton's study of colour uh, because, as he, and if you look at uh, Goethe's colour wheel, which he comes up with, which I think is just amazing, is each one of those sections of the cut of color, he talks about the affect of the color. Yeah, mm. that's a very important part of it for him. Mm. I think what he's doing there is actually to, sort of echoes of perhaps a previous discussion where, when you're talking about color, given that it only exists in the human eye, and that these effects of color, so that browns or oranges appear warm, blues always appear cold is almost shared by, as far as I know, across all cultures. So I think there's an element of that in Goethe's thing. So I think mm -hmm. I agree with you, but I think there is an element of Goethe, this delicate empiricism, wanting to take in affected features, affected mm. features. Yeah, let's bring Rodney in. Okay, well, that was very interesting. I. I wouldn't say that I agree completely, uh, but there is an element of truth regarding the romantic tradition that is breathing through Ilyenkov uh, and Luria and Vygotsky and all these uh, people. That's true, especially because all of them share um, a concern against what is become to know 
as scientificism, right? As this tendency to reduce um, uh, the human interest to the very technical, or let's say uh, this idea, I think it was uh, an author called Snow of the Two Cultures, right? When you got on the one hand, the humanistic uh, aspects of life. And then on the other hand, there are all the kind of people that take care of the scientific stuff. Uh, Ilyenkov was definitely against this, but I will say that he was not uh, romantic. He will, he will be protesting right now, uh, especially in the fourth essay of his book, Dialectical Logic, he explicitly addressed this problem when criticizing uh, Schelling philosophy. So um, uh, if I remember right, what he says is that uh, the answer of romantic, uh, the romantic notion of science to the problem of contradiction is that the artist, the genius artist can sense, can feel, and can appropriate contradiction in a non rationalistic way, in a non-conceptual way. So it is through Hegel that he solved this problem. Ilyenko bets uh, in, in favor of the concept as a way to resolve contradictions in reality, not through uh, uh, this romantic idea of the artistic or aesthetical uh, means to understand the contradiction it's in nature. So I, I think that's very important. It's a very important distinction that we should make. Ilyenkov is not an irrationalist thinker by no means. That being said, I, 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 first of all, I, I think you are correct in seeing the origin of the notion of the germ cell or all these metaphors come from the romantic, holistic view of nature, that's for sure. But the means that Ilyenko used to solve this problem is uh, come from the tradition that comes from Hegel, not from, you know, uh, Goethe, Hedda, or those people. So that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Just very quickly, I should have perhaps said, explained more fully when I gave the introduction. Uh, when Nuri is talking about romantic, or indeed at the end of it, towards the end of his life, when uh, Goethe is talking about romantic thinking, he absolutely rejected French romanticism, for example. He had no time for it. Um, so when I say romantic, I think it's really, I, I don't want that to be, I don't want anyone to think that what I'm saying is that he was a romantic in, say, the way that in mm. Do we all talk about Wordsworth as being a romantic? Definitely wasn't. Um, for Luria, uh, in his uh, biography, the reason he puts forward a romantic science is very much as a counter to what we might think of as positivistic or objectivist science. That's what he's against. Yeah. Great. That's David and then Yanis. I thought that was really interesting, and the discussion is really interesting too. I, I just wanted to add, um, I think it's important uh, that, I mean, this, these remarks about romantic science are important to you, yeah, but the, the, the last chapter of that uh, biography, the biography um, and I think that. I mean, the focus is primarily psychology. And so Luria's view is that it's really important that psychology, positive science, has to live reality, human psychology, which is not live, live by the live reality of human science. And psychology is very good at living <laughs> in that respect. And so um, yeah, that's Luria's rationale to continue to have case studies. Um, and I don't know whether um, Maria had in view a sort of generalization of that view to science per se. Um, but I just another thing I want to mention is that Luria's legacy 
it's quite significant and this is quite often overlooked because Luria, big influence on Michael Cole, for example, um, huge influence on Jerome Bruner and um, Oliver Sacks. So if you want an example of semantic psychology or, or meta neurons or whatever, then reading Oliver Sacks' case is a superb example of that, a continuation of that sort of um, uh, perspective that Luria initiated in the yeah, I just would agree completely. It's very interesting that the famous phrase about Vygotsky from Tolme, that he was the Mozart of psychology, he goes on to mention, and Luria was the Beethoven, um, and that's just forgotten, obviously, not given anything like that. Yeah, we've got about 10 minutes of discussion, but lots of people to bring in. Um, Yanis, next. You're muted. Me? Yeah. Okay, okay. Okay, okay. Uh, congratulations, um, Ian. Uh, I'm going to stress uh, one uh, methodological aspect which is related to romanticism in, in, in returning to Hegel. Um, uh, first uh, point that I would like to stress is that. Any theoretical or methodological approach which differs radically from objectivism, positivism, and, uh, and the like is not necessarily dialectical, which means it does not uh, identify itself with the ascent of the abstract or concrete as it is in capital. And second, I don't, I don't say that you, 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 you argue about that, but uh, Hegel's main critique of romanticism the methodological, the methodological critic of Hegel's romanticism is that uh, he apprehends the unity, and he uh, uh, seeks the unity, the conceptual unity, but it seeks this unity from the aspect of substantial uh, necessity, as, it's, as, as it is the case of Selling, Spinoza, Schleichemacher, Schlegel, and so on. So, the problem with uh, the uh, conception of the unity things that romanticism uh, provides is that it is a unity lack of difference. It's one unity that reduced the difference, the necessity, and to the part of the identity, of the part of the identity, while the uh, dialectical unity is the unity of the unity and the difference. And it is crucial my opinion, because the ascent from the abstract to the concrete that, that characterized the method of Marx capital differs, to my opinion, radically from the methodological requisites of the of romanticist movement, of the of, of the of the backgrounds and of the of the of the grounds and the prerequisites of romanticist methodology. That's my comment, and uh, your uh, talk it was very interesting, uh, Ian. It makes me uh, think a lot of things. Thank you. Yeah, um, just to, again to be clear, I wasn't saying that um, Marx's Capital is a romantic masterpiece. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't think even he would have claimed that. But um, it, it is the, what I was after was try, just trying to stress the, that for Marx, very clearly, the affective aspect of capital was extremely important. Thank you. And uh, Georgie? Uh, yes, hi. Do you hear me? Yeah. OK. Yeah, I don't know uh, if I should still pose the question, because um, Rogni basically um, uh, commented the same thing. But I wanted to say, yes, indeed, I mean, Marx breaks with romanticism pretty early. But at the same time, this kind of intuition about him, his emphasis on the affective side, I find it very important because I was reminded of that, um, that article by Roland Bohr, where he talks about the warm stream and the cold stream in Marxism and how like this cold stream is the political economy, the kind of cold uh, 
uh, analysis and then you got the Benjamin Bloch and others with the hope with emancipation and this like promise of uh, liberation and so on and so forth and this dialectic between the two is what kind of pushes Marxists and make, make, makes it uh, develop you know and so the Soviet Union Stalinism in, in particular was kind of presented as uh, just the something that keeps the cold part and completely puts aside this warm street, the hope, the emancipation, etc. And putting this back, I think in the Soviet Union is precisely Luria, Ilyenko and others who kind of represent that type of, uh, kind of puts back the, the, the warm stream into the, into the thing. But anyway, yeah, thank you very much uh, for your um, very interesting uh, presentation. I think that's a really important point. In that uh, chapter where he talks about romantic science, I, 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 he has to be very careful in his being as I said, sotto voce in his criticism of the official ideology, but it's very clear that he wants to restore, wants to have what you would call the warm content in Marxism. Yes. Thanks. Uh, let's see if we can have some short comments for about five minutes. Okay, yeah, thanks. Um, I started to, to comment in the in the chat already. I think there's some confusion concerning uh, the concept of, of, of romantic idea in my opinion i don't know what what you think um Luria was kind of appropriating it to the old thing so it, it's a little bit ir yeah. ironic that he says romantic science for him it's like a squaring circle or something like this you know I, that's so the paradox is there um on the other hand it, it has some truths in it as you as you already hinted at but it's, I think, the problem of the third wave. So the history of ideas, the history of knowledge has a very uh, bad understanding still of this kind of third wave uh, problem. Uh, I hinted at this in, in London's uh, talk. Uh, there is the kind, I, I call it a morphological uh, tradition. And uh, Hegel was so uh, angry with the actual ro romantics as well as Goethe was, as you, as you said because they were overstating something and, and making it one-sided, especially the effect of side again, uh, in, in, in our um, century, or uh, in the last century, it would have been the existentialist, so to say. Yes, yeah? that's critique of existentialism, which could be uh, very much understood in this way. So it's just to say that there's a long tradition behind, but we don't have yet a very good understanding of this tradition because it was, uh, as you also said in your biographical account, we always tend to fall into binary. We have science as a reductive endeavor on, on the one hand, and then we only always we have the reactions, phenomenology, romanticism, all of this. So that's the problem. I think. Yeah, yeah. Let's, let's have one more in here before you uh, return to us. <laughs> well, it's more like a side comment, you know. I... I haven't read just those books by Gloria, but it's a first was on that the first of the the shattered world. It's just that this these, these persons could not act, you know, they couldn't act because of their uh their incapabilities. And especially this memoria person and uh, the contextualization modality is lost to us. It's everything that you can't concentrate that blew things out and the shattered one probably couldn't to concentrate in one object. So I don't know what that means, but this is something that's back then. Yeah. Um, well, you should we do one part and give you the first words. Yeah. Anyway, it's brilliant. <laughs> um I I the fellow fellow German in Russia. I think the other one here, um sort of German. Um I think it's important to remember that I don't know who it was said that the country of Beethoven and Goethe and Schiller is also the country that became fascist and Nazi. And I think these two traditions and two conflicting cultures and theories and ideas are extremely relevant in today's world. And how was it that these things could happen in the same country? I think that's, you know, the question that's posed actually is quite. German Romanticism and German, I mean, actually, Goethe was more of a classical kind of sense, but then he's romantic. But he, he, bridged the, he bridged this area. Now, I know it's not something we're imposing, but 
I think the English Prime Minister likes to think about that. And it's, you know, the, 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 the way in which science is double tasked and it produces reaction and there are mythically, if you like, the irrational, rational, mental, and the vigilant society. The, the responsibilities of, of people, intellectual, cultural people, in that, in that process. Great, and back to you, Dr. Um, but yeah, I agree completely. Um, it's also in my own personal case, I think this would be for most British people of my age. The idea of when I was a kid of reading Goethe just wouldn't have happened because it was still the aftermath, cultural consequences of the war. Uh, it's such a loss, really, really, you know, to come to, come to him. When or to start reading Goethe in your forties, you know, you've lost forty years, but it, and um, you needed it. Um, the other thing was, I was just going to say in my notes, it, it, there was a note which said, "Be careful about romanticism." Um, <laughs> obviously, I needed to follow them more carefully. But what I would say very definitely again is that in his chapter on romantic science, I have no doubt that what Luria is really doing is arguing for romantic science as a counterbalance to uh, sort of uh, what passive as objectivist science today. I was going to talk, not, don't worry, I'm not going to start now. I was going to talk about motivation when I was preparing this. And if you want to say, being an educationalist, trying to be in teaching, uh, you actually see the absolute hopelessness of objectivist science when you come to study <laughs> motivation. There's almost nothing on motivation that is anything other than pap. Thank you. Yeah, that's, that's.